Let's just start with the first speaker. Fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes. Yeah. More or less. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, good afternoon. Uh, first, let me make a brief comment on the title of my presentation, which is the follow-up of another presentation that took place last year in Cairo uh, for the ASRIN 2018 17 meeting, EH meeting, where I presented uh, a tool, a technological tool, namely the first ontological platform on cybersecurity, which means not only knowledge representation, but also services to cybersecurity. Today, I would like to talk about that to explain why in the field of R&D and also of company uh, market, uh, this item is very important. Uh, let me simply say that you won't be here, you possibly won't be here in the future unless networks are protected and devices are protected as well. This is a matter of cybersecurity, which is the counterpart of the digital transformation revolution. I shall try to go fast because time is not enough. Does it work? Why? What happens? Well, let me start with uh, an obvious consideration, the increase of cyber attacks. And since we talk about uh, internet, uh, say, infrastructures as far as education and research is concerned, uh, I tell you that, among other domains, uh, last year, first semester, was a growth of 138% of attacks in the domain of online research and education. Uh, I should comment on what I mean by cybersecurity as a service, but let me simply say, at the very end of my presentation, this is my proposal to anybody who might be interested, is the development, the further development of our platform, which is already excellent and working, it is technology, it is not a project, to become an integrated uh, framework for cybersecurity defense. Of course, in the world of uh, activities uh, in this field, uh, everybody is looking for the definition of standards and tools for prevent prevention, detection, and resiliation in cyber attacks. Um, I shan't say anything about the approach. Let me only say that uh, if you take a look at cybersecurity market size, uh, the estimate uh, is that uh, this market size will uh, grow up to $170 billion by 2020 and have it to do with the number of stakeholders, which are the one that you see mentioned. I go quickly. And as for sub-markets, of course, different types of security types, network security, endpoint security, application security, content security, wireless security, cloud security, and of course, a number of activities, as you see by first service. As you know, the most uh, uh, dangerous activities uh, concern uh, governments. There is, uh, they talk about uh, cybersecurity and cyber warfare. And this is very, very, let's say, only problematic. Of course, public utilities. In the European Union, last, uh, this year in May, uh, we have uh, uh, definitely uh, uh, accepted two laws, two norms. They have to do with uh, cybersecurity and uh, protection, data protection, and they imply a very strong compliance by vendors and by institutions and companies as far as security is concerned. So they must be compliant. They must do risk assessment and risk evaluation. And there are no automatic tools so far that allow for these activities. Uh, this is a, an infographic where, for the first time in ESA, which is the European Agency of Cyber Security, utilizes a very important thing what, that is called QG. And namely, if you want to understand what an attack is, you must have uh, the path of the attack. And so far, many of analysis, many analysts, uh, move only on a local analysis, which doesn't say much, and it is not much useful for elaborating defense. As for the typology of logical impact, it uh, has to do with enormous amount of money that could be lost by companies and institutions. Of course, if we leave aside espionage, 
even though, I mean, that's all the espionage and let aside political institutional espionage. Of course, data exfiltration, destruction, manipulation, uh, service data encryption, these are some of uh, the typologies of logical impact that could create big problems. It thinks of financial, uh, of the financial infrastructures, of banks, of energy, of water, of transport. So these are the, the, the implications. So, I won't say what I mean by cybersecurity by defense. I shall all, always say that if we want to face this kind of challenge, we must have three blocks of activities. And the most important one, in my opinion, is to understand the phenomenon. And we can do that by knowledge, representation, and info sharing. This should give us the solutions for detection, removal, and alarm of cyber attacks and get into prevention and prediction. Companies that sell cybersecurity solutions say that they, they allow you to do prediction, prevention. It's ridiculous. No, there is no such technology so far. So let me come to the most interesting part, uh, in my opinion, of what I wanted to tell you. It has to do with the tools, uh, which means uh, scientific tools for knowledge representation, which has to do with the notion of ontologies and taxonomies. Um, nowadays, tools and standards for uh, the evaluation of taxonomies are a, in a sort of what I call a Babel status. Uh, I want just to mention uh, um, a statement by Barina at the very end of the last century where he explained the relevance of ontology in the fields of artificial intelligence, computational linguistics, database theory, and he explained that it is a very highly interdisciplinary field. What I was saying to someone before coming here is that you cannot have a, a data architecture or even you cannot have an ontology of taxonomy and unless you know what you're talking about. So uh, data semantics have nothing to do with the courses that are at present studied at universities in the field of, of computer science and engineering. So we have to have different means of facing this kind of research uh, uh, domain. This is more or less when I have to make a representation of uh, artificial intelligence proposed. A digital mind, namely uh, artificial intelligence, is not a, the sum of different applications, for instance, in the field of uh, machine learning, deep learning, etc., IoT. Uh, it's the emulation of the function of the human brains as far as data are concerned. Um, therefore, artificial intelligence and data are related, strictly related, because we need modeling of data by means of the definition of logical semantic relationships. Uh, here I would make a, a, a short, a brief explanation. This morning I understood that uh, I, I didn't get in uh, technical contact with an interventional mind with the uh, person who was speaking. Uh, metadata languages are not up to the point. They are solutions for technological interoperability. We do not have so far tools for having logical semantic interoperability. This is the point. And so far, logical descriptors cannot take so far into consideration this dimension. So if we want to have a knowledge representation, we must have a logical semantic representation of contents. As this is the, the kind of approach we should, everybody should uh, uh, use. I mean, a middle-out approach means that we have used data coming from different sources, but we have restructured data and reformulated data. And let me come to the distinction between ontologies and taxonomies. In many cases, I mean, the two see, uh, things seem to go together. An ontology is a system of entities related by logical, semantic uh, relationships, which are not the ones you are used to, to face. In most literature, you have the definition is a, and then you have properties and attributes. This is too little. You can, you'll see how the application can go a little bit further. Uh, taxonomies, instead, should be classifications. 
But classifications of data, as you shall see uh, in the experience that I shall present, are really very poor. And the, uh, the question is why? Why classifications are so poorly done? So uh, what I shall uh, briefly sum up for you is uh, literature on the subject that uh, can be articulated into general versus domain and subdomain ontologies, uh, ontologies and taxonomies relations, vocabulary standards and goals of the strict of the description. Um, you will notice uh, briefly these uh, four uh, contributions among which I put mine as well, of our ontology platform, are midway between a general upper level ontology and domain ontology. This complicates things because if, if upper level ontology is not well defined, you cannot have a good domain ontology. You will also notice briefly how Ontologies change their entitling. Uh, we talk now about uh, uh, cyber threat intelligence and resilience, semantic threat modeling, cyber threat intelligence, vulnerability ontology. Wow, wow, wow. These are all components of a general ontology. And as far as taxonomy, this is a very good one. Van Herd and attack taxonomy is quite good. Whereas Inesa was a disaster. This is the result of Inesa work where they compare some 30 search having to do with classification of malware. And they say they didn't even succeed to have an upper level uh, categorization. So it's terrible. Now these uh, teams Excelsius must work together and they don't have a, a basis to work on. And this is the most interesting proposition by NIST. And NIST has worked, has done a fantastic amount of work uh, in this field with the Metric Corporation. They spent a fantastic amount of money. And this is their proposal where they propose the ontological development of platforms through control vocabularies and semantic interoperability. You can see on the right hand left down, they give an example of what, uh, say, the, the, the types of relations should be. Uh, this is only partial. This is the beginning of a more complicated work. Uh, this is what they have done. If you visit the uh, internet uh, through these uh, links, you find out they have done a fantastic amount of enumerations of concepts. And this is the way they have uh, taken care of bugs, vulnerabilities. They have a fantastic open database where you can see day by day, I would say, uh, week after week, uh, what type of incidents they have taken care of. And it is open to any form of collaboration. Uh, this is an interesting uh, resilience ontology put forward by Inisa 2011. Uh, if I can show a flow, the flow has to do with at the, the taxonomical level it might even uh, be accepted, but there is no ontological model behind this ontology, which is also very interesting. Uh, this is the way they represented business ontology. And so I need five more minutes. This is a Norwegian, Norwegian project, uh, well, of course, uh, the same is true for this proposal. The, this is not an ontology. It's very nice articulation items. And this is a comparison of ontologies where 60% uh, are concentrated on attacks. But as the uh, authors uh, uh, state, uh, there is no possibility of uh, uh, verifying the quality of the analysis. This is what they propose, and this is so far is not at best it might be a taxonomy. It's an interesting listing of items. Uh, I want to stress, if, uh, I shall come in a minute to the conclusions. If you have a look at people who pretend to apply metadata languages to ontology, uh, making a mistake, um, the mistake is quite visible here. These kind of logical descriptors have nothing to do with the description of logical semantic relationships in a knowledge representation. Excellent, uh, as I say, excellent systems, but no useful for the purpose. Uh, 
uh, this is a, one of the proposals. And we, when they come to the point of listing what they call important classes in ontology, they simply list a number of items, important items, but no ontology. Means, consequences, attack, attack, attack pattern, exploit, blah, blah, blah. The only useful proposal is that have a network, what the proposal linked open data, where a number of sources for ontological development are available. The uh, limitations of this approach, I have already said, this is another comparison. Let me come briefly, and so I will get to the conclusion of what we have done. We have uh, proposed uh, univocal applications of representation concepts, namely entities and their relationships, both at the upper level and the mid-level ontology. The constituents of our platform, which is operative, it is not a project that has to be done. It is done. It is a prototype, and we propose it for collaboration in this context. It has to do with cybersecurity domain ontology as a general domain ontology, a cybersecurity pragmatic ontology, which has to do with applications, with cybersecurity knowledge and semantic vocabulary in general. So we deal with different levels, entities, semantic and pragmatic relations. More or less, this is the structure where we have avoided the mistakes of uh, uh, classifications and ontologies. They have to face equivocal uh, definitions. Uh, natural languages are equivocal, uh, polysemic by definition. So this is the point to be explored. And so our structure is both taxonomical and ontological. This is more or less how it looks, our ontology. And anyway, I have come to, to the end. We propose in our platform, this is a, a screenshot of the platform, which is online, of course, uh, seven analytical areas for specific subsecurity services, and in particular, two area uh, besides uh, the ones I mentioned before for risk assessment, risk evaluation, remediation techniques, specific applications for data recording and incident reporting, statistics, metrics, etc. What are my conclusions? I think that from this, first of all, I want uh, to propose a joint venture with uh, people who might be interested in this kind of activity. Just think that all over the world, big companies try to work on the uh, supply of solutions. Uh, what I wanted to say that my proposal for enhanced uh, context is an integrated platform uh, having at its core proposal cybersecurity as a service, where on one side we have to do with uh, description, knowledge description, and on the other side with design tools that can be used both by the uh, research uh, community and by vendors, developers, they need to know what to do so a platform, integrated platform, could be helpful in this perspective. That's all. Thanks for the attention. Thank you, Elisa. And now with our uh, second esteemed speaker, Salim Zifler al Ashab. Not, not Abu Shanab or Al Shanab. <laughs> The correct name is, this is the correct name appearing now, and this is the name of the university, abbreviated as AAPU. Okay, now I am a mathematician, as I said yesterday. I want to talk about magic squares, so it seems to be uh, mathematics with some mysterious things, yeah? But it's, uh, maybe some people think that this is a mysterious subject, but I talk about mathematics now. So can I, how can I, this is slideshow? Oh, oh, right. Yeah, what is a magic square? So by a magic square, we mean a matrix where the sum of letters in all rows, columns, and both main diagonals is the same. This is called a magic constant. I will give you now uh, an example, when non-example from the ancient uh, times, Chinese times. So if we sum in the first row or any other row or column on both main diagonals, like 2, 5, 8, so we get 15, or 4, 5, 6, we get also 15. And actually, this is the only square up to isomorphism, as we say in mathematics. So you can rotate, you can reflect, and you get the same square, so just one square. And uh, now I can define a general uh, magic square of order n, 
so that I will arrange the numbers from 1 to n square in an n by n square or matrix, uh, of course, all inters distinct, and I want to have the same sum in all directions. So I have, according to mathematics, to take the magic constant n by n square plus 1 over 2. Uh, for example, now the magic square of order 6 will have the magic co constant 1, 1, 1. As I told you, there is only just one square of order 3, well known from ancient times. Of order 4, it was known 200 years ago. Uh, it was uh, 220 times 32, and now 32 stands for the transformations, which uh, take one square to others, but actually it's the same square in the ascension. So this result was at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, verified by computers. Okay, uh, no, no, sorry. At the beginning of the, 20, uh, of the 20th century, it was verified uh, computationally by mathematicians. Of course, it was uh, verified by computers as the result of the 5 by 5 squares. It's a big number, about uh, 2 billion. This was computed in 1973 using computers. Okay, it took two t days in that time t to calculate this number. Now, the challenge is to calculate the number in case of order six. This is an open problem where I work. Yeah, 10 years ago, I found this uh, link where you find the code, and they say it will take about 220,000 years to calculate the number of all natural squares of order six. And there are some people, non-mathematicians sometimes, they have estimated the number to be about 1.7 times 10 power 19. So this is still an open problem uh, where I work. Um, now I de defined some special cases, subsets, we say in mathematics, of the magic square in order to be able to Calculate, uh, calculated. So uh, now, pan diagonal magic square. We add some uh, properties like all pan diagonals sum up to the same magic sum. And the four corner property magic square, the sum of all corners of any inside four by four square sums up to seventy four. As we use in mathematics the symbols a11 to a66 to denote a matrix. So I have three equations and. Uh, the three equations should lead to 2s, where 3s is the magic constant, okay? 3s, now 2s is two-thirds of it. Uh, there, are a lot, there are a lot of such squares. This is one of these squares. I have finished counting these squares three years ago using an HPC access to the grid system offered by the European Union in that time from Italy, so thanks. I would like to thank them for that help. Now this uh, squares, for example, if you look at the corner 13, 3, 23, 35, it uh, will sum up to 74. Also, uh, the middle squares, 27, 10, 22, 15, sums up or to, to also to 74. So, how is the program constructed and why do I need HPC and how can we make some codes? This may be interesting for other uh, people not understanding very well mathematics. So, I have loops, nested loops sometimes, where um, and uh, I have at some stages some variables to be calculated, and these variables must satisfy the conditions that are right down below here uh, in order to be in the range from 1 to 36. So nested loops uh, will make it uh, easy to make parallel computing. Okay, so if you use parallel computing like the grid system, then you can split the job into so many jobs, all of them done simultaneously, and then you get all the results and collect them together. So the program, as I said, some of which is it's easily parallelizable, it can be split into several problems, and our task as mathematicians is to use symmetries in order to reduce the 
runtime. We, as I said, there are sometimes eight transformations, sometimes 32 in the case of uh, four by four squares. So mathematicians think how can we uh, make transformations, property preserved transformations that will reduce the amount of calculations. And the task will be then carried out by computers when we have the right code for that. Uh, in the case of six by six squares, I was able to find 16 property preserving transformations. So the number which I will get is going to be multiplied with 16. So actually, I said uh, it's very hard to calculate all six by six squares. So I have made a subset. Uh, here I took the main diagonals and I have put some conditions on the diagonals in order to avoid uh, symmetries to do calculations. So each unique pair of diagonals, okay, uh, presents a different general pair of diagonals. This is the conditions, something like arrangement of the numbers. This can be done by some permutations, some rotations. And uh, this is the number of uh, all six by six NPDs. Uh, it's a huge number and uh, everyone, uh, every two pairs of diagonals will represent some squares, we have to use them. Uh, then I have moved one step more in order to uh, be able to calculate something without HPC, uh, using my own computer, because I don't have access to HPC, and that's why I was coming here in order to search for access to HPC in order to carry out the job. Now, I've uh, considered two uh, subsets where I put some conditions on the main diagonals for the Ks or the Ls, that is, they sum up to 37, which is one third of 111, okay? Which is uh, now one S. So they are called the first subset centrally symmetric pairs, where we think that symmetry about the center, and the center and one with these two conditions just for K and L, it's called axially symmetric. And I have got these main results. Uh, now, uh, the number in the middle line, in the middle of the page, where we find the number of balanced uh, magic squares, uh, which is the title of my presentation, but with the square matrix with self-similar uh, pairs of diagonals. It's this uh, huge number multiplied with 24 and 8. And as I said, these factors are, correspond to some transformations. So eight is the non-classical eight transformations of a magic squares. 24 is another one just specifically for this type where we use the property of being self-similar pair. So this will give you more uh, transformations, property processing transformations. They would re reduce the uh, runtime, and uh, you can get the actual number by multiplication with these two factors. I have also calculated so many other subsets. Uh, just numbers, for me, they are important for some of them. It's not very important, but I think that this is a joint point where, uh, where uh, IT experts uh, can cooperate with mathematicians in order to solve some of their problems and they, to test their uh, computers, to test their codes, okay, they can get some ideas out about some problems from the mathematics which are unsolved till now. Yeah, uh, at the end I can say in this paper we walked further steps in the direction of solving problems of counting magic squares six by six, the subset of four uh, uh, corner magic squares uh, was counted in two, it's a reference, I will, uh, written by me, I will show you later. Uh, the number of free types, uh, free variables, or the, the independent variables, or the loops, the number, let's say in the language of IT, the loops were 18. Well, the number of uh, these loops will be uh, 21 for the case of balanced squares and 23 in the general case. And when we have more moves, then we have more calculations. And so that's why we need runtime or use HPC to in order to be able to calculate this. So in the future, I hope that I will be able to calculate at least the number of balanced squares uh, using HPC or some uh, high 
performance computers uh, may be available in our country, Jordan. Um, at the end, I said, here are some the references where I talked about some results and also some people from all over the world, like Trump in Germany and Rugono, who are talking about magic squares. We are a small community of mathematicians and non-mathematicians interested in such uh, problems. And here's a list of my work on this topic, magic squares, which I finished actually in 2016. I'm make, taking a rest because I don't have access to HPC as I had before. And thanks for listening. Many thanks, Salim. It's now with our uh, third esteemed speaker, uh, Mahmoud, please. Assalamu alaikum. <clears throat> good morning, good afternoon. My name is Mohamed Mohamed from Simad University of Somalia. Today I want to share with you evaluation of ICT in Somalia higher education. The weakness and the strengths which are existing there. And these two days we have been talking about the importance of ICT in education, especially in higher education. And yes, there is importance in the utilization of ICT. But in some countries, higher education is really using ICT as required, while some other countries are still behind. In my country, most of universities started to use even computers in 2000. This means they are in the early stage. Uh, at some time, according to my knowledge, there's no researches on the area of ICT in the utilization of higher education. The objective of this research is to know really the status of the ICT utilization in Somali higher education. How far society knows know about the importance of the utilization of ICT. And the real status of the utilization of ICT in our higher education. We selected 30 universities in all over country and distributed 300 copies questionnaire. This is our proposed model to know the real status of the ICT in Somali higher education. We selected four categories, and each category has some indicators. For example, ICT infrastructure, to know the real status, we used five indicators. And each of these five indicators has its own sub-indicators. ICT strategy plan, we used, we used four indicators. Institutional ICT learning, we use a three, and society attitude towards ICT, we use a two indicators. Those are 14 indicators, and the result will be based on these 14 indicators. The findings show that ICT infrastructure and Really, we were looking at this stage, 
and the stage is between one, I see the stage, you know what I mean, between one and four. One is the lowest stage, and the four is the highest stage. As you see here, minimum indication is one, while the maximum is 2.9. So, access to the OMBC or shared computer 2.9, network speed 2.6, those are above average. But internet availability is low as well. In the side of institutional ICT learning, and the lowest indication shows availability of adequate local content. Those universities are missing local content. 0.6 is less than minimum stage. But all less than average, 1.5, 1.4, it shows weak. ICT strategic plan. Measuring on this, the weakest area here is ICT security is very weak, 0 0.8, less than 1. The others, the other are average. Society attitude. For the society attitude, there were two indicators. Management awareness of the ICT importance and a staff understanding of ICT benefits. Those are, those are sub indications. And normally, this area, the only problem is shown is management attendance, attention to the ICT important. But almost, mostly is above average. Overall performance of the 14, 14 indicators are shown here. Three indicators are very low. ICT security, internet availability, and availability of adequate local content. These three areas is very weak. The other is I, Yes, some less than average and some above average. In conclusion, the stage of ICT utilization in Somalia higher education is 46%, lower than average. Lower than average. The area which is very weak, as I said before, is the local content, ICT security, and internet availability. For example, for internet availability, 1 MB is around $300. So it's not easy to use internet in any way, in the campus or out of the campus. This was my recommendation to the government and to my universities, Somali universities. These three items are to be solved urgently. It's the local content problem, ICT security problem, and internet affordability problem. What I know is all of you are familiar with this problem. So I appreciate if you contribute, how can we solve this problem? Thank you. Many thanks, Mahmoud. And now with our fourth speaker, Abed, please. 
Assalamu alaikum to everyone. Uh, I will be presenting a tactical data link, a resilient long haul, wide medium for tactical armed forces communication networks. Uh, my name is uh, Abed Ali Minhas. I am from Al Yamama University, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, this is actually joint work, and uh, we are actually three authors. Ahmed Qadus, me, Abed Ali Minhas, Hamad Anwar Sayyid. This work is actually done in Pakistan for uh, Pakistan Army. Uh, in Pakistan, there is a National Radio Telecom Corporation, uh, City Haripur, Pakistan, and then Bahia University, Islamabad, Pakistan, and the third one is Al Yamama University. Flow of presentation is that first abstract then study of existing system, motivation of the problem, uh, the problem which was identified, then in a statement it will be described, and what were the research objectives uh, in order to solve this problem, what were the design requirements that we put for uh, uh, this, and then we proposed a solution, actually more than one, I'll explain you. Uh, then we fix some uh, design parameters, functional parameters, and at the end I will discuss the results uh, that we achieved, uh, whether they were going to meet our design requirements or not. Finally, conclusions uh, that will be presented. Now, the first thing is uh, abstract. Uh, in this research, problem of communication link that is solved and uh, we have proposed the use of uh, three deployment scenarios for the achievement of maximum data rates through uh, the tactical data link system over 15 kilometer half length. Uh, the first was deployment of a thick copper conductor diameter wire, AWG-15. Uh, it was uh, modified to another one, AWG-18, which offers actually low resistance, which further allows maximum flow of electrical pulses through it, and this result in low bit error rates and high signal to noise ratio. Then we propose third solution. I will explain you why we propose three. Uh, deployment of a TT wire channel. Uh, it is proposed to adjust the transmission and reception line rates of the technical data link system units, both on the transmission as well as uh, on the reception sites. Uh, we did some changes in the firmware setting uh, then configuration, which can allow the technical data link system units to transmit and receive even in poor conditions uh, with thinner copper conductor diameter wires. Uh, first, I will tell you what was the existing system uh, present with Pakistan Army. Uh, the technical data link uh, is actually Ethernet extender technology based on symmetrical high-speed digital subscriber line and it uses a data link standard. Most of you will be knowing this one. Now, the device uh, can form a long haul operational ethernet uh, network on a single twisted pair cable up to 15 kilometer at data rates up to 14 to 15 megabits per second. Further, the data rate can be doubled uh, up to 27 to 30 megabits per second uh, by using port bonding. And this TDL uh, is used by uh, different armies in different parts of the world. Initial idea of a TDL was that was introduced by United States of America. Now in many countries, Australia, UK, uh, Pakistan, they are using this one. Uh, TDL transmit Ethernet traffic over the copper conductor wire by using line coding technique that I'll explain you. Uh, this is actually a mechanism for converting binary 0 and 1. Uh, present in uh, data stream into scale wave electrical pulses, which can then transmit over a copper conductor wire. Now, when we studied uh, the existing system that uh, why there was a problem, uh, problem was of the link, sometime link was down and uh, received signal strength RSS that was lower than the criti criti critical value of the RSS. So that's why the received signal was not translated into uh, the meaningful signal. So after studying previous deployment of armed forces tactical communications during mission critical applications, the drawback was establishment of circuit switch connectivity between the near and far end technical uh, data link units. 
This problem of resilient long haul wide medium for tactical uh, armed forces communication network is affected by high beta error rate, whose consequences are low signal to noise ratio levels, which further results in repercussions of transmission and reception of data due to poor line conditions and tentative disconnections. Now, the problem identified in the existing system. After doing many experiments from transmitter up to receiver, uh, we try to find out uh, uh, the signal strength at uh, different locations. Uh, it was revealed that uh, it was problem of unshielded cable, NTDL. So it was not supporting end connectivity and uh, giving uh, bit error rate and uh, not giving high SNR. Now, so we formulated our problem uh, after studying existing system that the major operational hurdle faced by TDL system when deployed in field over 15 kilometer hop length is was establishment of circuit switch connectivity between the near and far end technical data link units. The connectivity cannot be established due to high bit error rates whose consequences are low signal to noise ratio levels which further results in repercussions of transmission and reception of data due to poor line conditions and tentative uh, disconnections. In order to solve this problem, we set certain research objectives. Uh, the first thing was to do thorough analysis of resilient long haul wide medium for uh, tactical armed forces communication network, which are obstructed by connectivity issues to low signal to noise ratio values, which results in high beta error rate. Uh, the second research objective was to eliminate uh, a high beta error rate problem, which results in uh, high packet loss and delays. And the third objective that was set to eliminate major drawback of the communication unavailability uh, in uh, TDL network. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we achieved all of these uh, three objectives. I'll show you at the uh, end of my uh, presentation. Now, uh, in order to achieve these uh, design objectives, we set certain design requirements that what should be, we should be having at the end uh, in a quantified manner, uh, quantitatively. So, we wanted to achieve uh, throughput near to 30 megabits per second. Uh, this is the maximum limit. Uh, if we are having 30 megabits per second, it was acceptable, no problem even up to uh, 26 megabits per second was okay. So this was uh, our uh, design requirement as a first uh, number. Then we wanted to reduce uh, uh, bit error rate as low as possible, and we wanted to achieve SNR, signal to noise ratio, as high as possible. As you know, nowadays uh, in uh, copper medium, uh, normally noise is not affecting much. Now, proposed solutions. We actually uh, presented three solutions, uh, and they all were accepted, but I'll tell you why we presented uh, three solutions. Uh, in this investigation, three deployment scenarios they were proposed. The first one was use of uh, shielded AWG-15. It was having diameter of 1.4503 millimeter, and it was having low resistance as compared to the other two. We propose the second one, use of a shielded AWG-18, diameter 1.02 millimeter. Uh, it was having medium resistance as compared to one and three. The third one was use of copper TT wire AWG-20. Uh, it was having diameter 0 0.8 millimeter. Uh, it was having high resistance as compared to the first and the second deployment. Now to adjust the transmission and reception line rates of TDL system units, both on the transmission and uh, reception sides. Uh, here we did some firmware uh, configuration settings, uh, which can allow the technical, tactical data link system units to transmit and receive in power line condition with thinner copper connected diameter wires. You know, when we deployed the first one, uh, it was perfect. But you know, the, uh, the client, the end user, they told to us no, they were going, uh, they wanted to go for a small diameter. Then we went for AWG-18, even then they were not agreed. We achieved uh, 29 megabits per second because they were saying that they were working in the field. So they wanted to as, as thin as possible 
so then we went for uh, TTY AWG20. Now the good thing is that uh, we achieved even over here uh, the 30 Mbps and the uh, low beta error rate, high SNR. Now there's a trade-off by the way, right? Trade-off is that while going from one to three deployment, uh, there's a flexibility if you go from one to three. Flexibility of carrying, uh, carrying the conductors with you, uh, especially in the field, uh, in mission critical applications. However, there's a more bit error rate and less SNR that we have to set through some intelligent configuration of the firmware that we did. Uh, now, uh, in uh, this scheme, we used the 2B 1Q line coding scheme. Uh, this scheme was actually uh, chosen to minimize error propagation. And here we used a gray code scheme. Those, mashallah, out of you who know digital logic and design, you might be knowing you know, that gray code, they're excellent because from one step to another, there's only one bit change. So the inter inter symbol interference can be minimized if we use a gray coding scheme. Now the levels, uh, here symbols were defined. Data was coming in the form of uh, 0 and 1. So we uh, made symbols uh, for two bits per symbol, uh, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And we will allotted uh, four voltages, uh, minus 3, minus 1, plus 1, and plus 3. But while allotting these voltages, as I told you, uh, we used a gray code scheme. If you compare these two, the top one is simple 1011 logic, and the lower one is our scheme that we introduced to be 1Q. It is a 1011 001101. Now, uh, this was increasing uh, uh, the data rate as compared to if we use a uh, one bit symbol. Now, this line coding scheme is used, uh, which is actually four level PAM, PAM4 scheme, and uh, also refers to as signal modulation technologies. Uh, advantage of this scheme is that by denoting single electrical pulse by two binary bit results, maximization of available channel bandwidth. And this is uh, very good as far as uh, bandwidth utilization is concerned. So even if we use for the communication channel, which is having bandwidth of four kilohertz, so uh, this is perfect. This is the table just for the depiction. That how we allotted 0, 0 to minus 3 volt, 0, 1 to minus 1, 1, 0 to plus 3, 1, 1 to plus 1. Uh, this is uh, the picture of uh, uh, the system unit uh, that uh, we had uh, used. Uh, now I'll directly go to the parameters uh, that uh, we used. Uh, I'll be a little bit fast uh, uh, because this is more technical things. Uh, here we had uh, four uh, transmission channels. It was capable of 15 megabits per second at uh, each channel. If we combine two channels, this is a port bonding scheme that increased 15 to 30 megabits per second. So 30 for uplink, 30 for downlink, total 16, 60 megabits per second. And uh, TDL can be configured for all modes of uh, operation. We can uh, configure point-to-point -point ring and mesh topologies. Uh, the rated voltage was uh, uh, 12 to 48 volts, operating voltage, current 475. Uh, we fix all these things, you know. Uh, then these functionalities, they were uh, achieved over there. Port burning feature that was used, I'll show you in, in the result. Uh, we used uh, Ethernet extender modules and uh, four SSDS modules, four LAN, one DC, seven port switch. Tool used. Tool used is, uh, okay, there are two things. One is the classified work done within Pakistan Army. Sorry to say, we cannot declare those results, right? However, parallel to that one, which we were allowed to declare, we can use open source tool for the same. That is the, the Tama Soft tools. It's a wireless performance uh, parameter. So quickly, I'll go to the results, guys, because I have only one minute left. Sorry for that. Uh, this is the tool output, as you can see. Uh, we, uh, by using this tool, Tama Soft, uh, we disabled uh, the UDP traffic, but we enabled the TCP traffic. And you can see on the top uh, that uh, over here, if cursor can move, uh, but the top, if you see, uh, we are achieving, uh, roughly speaking, about uh, 27 to 29 megabits per second. So Alhamdulillah, the design objective that we met, we initially said 30. We could not achieve 30. But we reached to 27 to 30. And sometimes we, we found a glitch. You see, uh, I just want to tell you. Uh, we found a glitch 
and this was due to uh, our uh, uh, tool that uh, we were using. And the last uh, thing is about the scenario number three. Uh, one minute. One, one minute. Okay. Uh, for the last, when we reached to the last option, which was uh, the TT wire, it was uh, thin. It was offering more resistance. It was offering us difficulty of uh, more bit error rate as compared to the previous two deployments. So what was done over here that uh, we did some intelligent configuration of the tools. We set different types of uh, modulation schemes. We set different type of channel conditions. I am I'm not having time. I'm so sorry for that. But I'm telling you, uh, showing you the result. But even for the third deployment, Alhamdulillah, we achieved 14.5 uh, megabits per second. And for the dual channel, we achieved 29. Not 30 again, but 29. It was more than enough for us. Uh, so directly to the last slide, concluding. Uh, to solve problem of link failure, three deployment scenarios they were suggested. They included AWG 15, 18, and TT wire. All scenarios were successfully deployed. Design requirements of uh, throughput, low bit error rate, and high SNR, they were achieved as per design requirements. Thank you very much, Punajila. Assalamu alaikum. Many thanks, Abit. And now, uh, with the final esteemed uh, speaker, Kenny Lewy. Um, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to present to you this afternoon. This is a paper that we wrote jointly. Uh, we are three of us. My name is Mrs. Kenelo Zuba from the University of Botswana, and I wrote with two of my colleagues who are in Val University of Technology in South Africa. So our topic is mobile healthcare benefits and the health threat post by mobile threat uh, mobile health technologies in Africa. So our, my presentation is going to um, have uh, cover those areas. Uh, the introduction and introduce our paper, and then um, the literature behind our paper, and then the purpose of our study, because it's a narrative um, review paper that we did uh, based on data that is, the data that is uh, available from different sources that will be covered under the methods that we used. And then we'll discuss, I'll discuss the results and then discussions and conclusions. So mobile health actually is a hot topic. Um, the main thing about mobile health is that it uses mobile technology, specifically mobile devices such as uh, laptops, mobile phones, tablets, and so on, which with, they have to have internet connectivity for them to be useful and to be able to support health and improve health. Then um, there are services that are delivered over these mobile uh, technology devices which makes, which improves health, which includes the use of SMS, which is short messaging service, social media like Facebook, Twitter, emails, and so on. But our paper is going to specifically concentrate on the use of uh, SMS, which is short messaging services in in various countries in Africa. So for the purpose of this paper, since mHealth is a diverse topic which doesn't have any um, standard meaning, for the purpose of this paper, uh, mHealth will mean uh, any public or private health uh, activities made possible by mobile devices, spe uh, specifically um, SMS over mobile phones. So mobile health has the, um, actually mobile services, they've got the technology that is, uh, that is uh, advancing and expanding, is actually transforming the healthcare, and is key to modern healthcare solutions, according to the research that we did. Mobile devices, portability and ability to operate with minimal infrastructure um, is regarded as better option to deliver these health services, especially in developing countries. So this uh, healthcare in developing countries in the African context is actually characterized by limited access to healthcare services, delivery of these uh, services, high cost, low quality, and uh, delay to meet the needs of the clients, which can lead to fatal results, especially if they are suffering from chronic diseases, which comes from unhealthy lifestyles. 
So this is crippled furthermore by the poverty of the continent, uh, ever increasing population growth, loaded with high cases of diseases and um, inadequate health workers. So basically, the main um, the main uh, detrimental factor again to this is that the the healthcare players in the dis developing countries are separated by vast distances, um, and then further concerned by poor communication infrastructure, absolute IT solutions that impede their pot pot potential to collect and disseminate inf information in time. And um, M Health has been uh, identified as a viable solution to improve the health care, as I've already mentioned, especially when uh, considering that uh, it needs a minimal M Health gadget, uh, for instance, the SMS. Just the users need to just have a mobile phone. So the statistics that we found was that um, in 1998, Africa has less than four, had less than 4 million mobile phones. And then at the end of 2015, about 46% of African population subscribed to mobile devices and is expected to have more than 725 million um, unique subscribers by the year 2020. So according to African Health Observatory, Penetration of mobile phones and associated mobile networks is developing in developing countries such as Africa, especially, makes uh, these um, services to be legitimate and possible, which is good news. So the purpose of this our study was to analyze possible hazards. First of all, the benefits that are derived from the use of these mobile phones, um, and uh, this is to be used as mobile health equipment to the environment and the well-being. The method that we use, as I um, specified already, this is a narrative review paper. So we're based on the literature that we collected, which we use assisted by this Atlas uh, TI software, which is an existing software that helps researchers to analyze um, and make comprehensive and objective results about a specific topic. So formal searches were done using uh, the following databases, LCV, PubMed, Google Scholar, and then uh, the search was restricted to research articles, date of our, our publication 2014 to 2017, and uh, publication language English. And then uh, the information that we collected, we used keywords like mobile health, and health benefits, and then within those selected articles, we went further deep into those that address the benefits that are derived out of this use of this mobile technology, specifically SMS. And then we funnel the search results to add to articles that um, talk M health benefits in African context. Then we continued on doing a second literature, literature search again, which focused on the effects of this and health obsolete devices. Uh, we used the gray literature, Google Scholar, and LCV databases, and then we used the following keywords, mobile health devices and environment friendliness, green mobile health, electronic waste and environment, and e-waste and health. So these are the results that we, we got from our research. Basically, they are divided into two. It's a brief examination of various benefits um, that, we, that, 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 is, uh, that, that, that is made possible by this mobile device in MHO. Extensive review of the potential environmental risks and uh, well-being hazards associated with uh, this discarded or wanted home um, um, mobile, uh, well, mobile technology devices. So these are the benefits that we, we found out from the research that we, got, we were doing, that actually in health, um, that mobile technology is, is, the trans, is bringing trans, transformative power in these healthcare services in Africa. And it enhances communities, both rural and urban, with up-to-date knowledge and information. Improved service delivery, reduced reaction time during uh, emergencies. Yet, all this, amid all these benefits, there's also the human error 
and then also these mobile devices get lost. And then uh, these smartphones, is today the cyber security is a hot topic. It also would affect this because smartphones and uh, all these mobile devices used because of this vulnerability to hacking viruses and malware, especially when these devices are secured through internet connectivity. So here is just a brief, um, a brief, a brief results that we got from the from how this uh, SMS is used is helping in healthcare in Africa. So in Kenya, so <laughs> my site, I need to get my pick. In Kenya, this um, they use SMS is it's benefiting to get up to date list of health professionals and centers making possible for the for the users to locate uh, health services that are near them which is a plus and then in mozambique the sms is used to relay much needed information to people with hiv and then um, the, the educational information also help infected people on how to adhere to treatment and prevent mother to child transmission of hiv South Africa SMS used to, is used to provide pregnancy, postnatal, and baby care information to women in their preferred language. The service is actually called Mama SMS. In Rwanda, SMS service called Rapid SMS um, and, and Ubu, Ubu Zima is used to track uh, pregnant women and newly born babies and promote uh, early detection of life-threatening emergencies. In Botswana, where I come from, they also use this SMS to to deliver, improve actually the the for for them to the the, the patients are willing to receive messages to remind them about appointments and also when to take medications with their mobile phones because this is also another area that needs to be talked about because it's not everybody who would want their telephone uh, line, their telephone um, their telephone numbers to be to be known and used so the fact that is a is for their benefit so it's it's a it's a it's a plus in the side of the healthcare system because that will improve and remind them when to take their medications. So there is also the downside of the use of this mobile technology. So this is another area that we covered because whilst we looked at the benefits of using mobile devices, then we also used at the, we also looked at the environmental risks and well-being hazards of mobile health, in mobile health devices. So, so we wanted to find out what are the environmental and well-being threats that are contained by this retired equipment. So literature shows that when this obsolete equipment are not managed properly, they actually become a health and environmental hazard. So the next slide will talk about what is e-waste, electronic waste. So like mHealth, there's no standard definition for e-waste, which, uh, which is agreed upon like um, globally, but it comes with different uh, definitions given by literature or the literature that we found. But for the purpose of this paper, e-waste will be defined as any mobile health equipment wanted by, by its owner or users regardless of equipment functional state. So what that means is that it could be that the, the mobile device is still in a working or functional state, but maybe you want to go for a better one. So what do you do with the one that you already have? So the, the characteristics of this uh, e-waste is that it's a complex problem, and these uh, mobile devices, they are not decomposable waste, and then there's no sim single method to properly manage them. So this includes e-waste could be both valuable and also it could be toxic metals. So the, we extended our research into identifying how can it be valuable, and we found out that these metals include and are not limited to gold, silver, copper, aluminum, and then they can also be toxic, like cadmium, mercury, brom uh, bromine, and lead. So this uh, US toxicity contaminates uh, actually the environment, and then it is, we found out from our papers that it was associated with some cases of liver cancer, lower birth weight, asthma, and other health pro uh, problems. So management of this e-waste is a big issue. And then 
it has actually um, been found that it results in adverse uh, effects on the environment and health. According to Jolanda, he found that these elevated exposures to e-waste toxic materials from a former recycling facility. Then you can imagine if there's e-waste from a former uh, recycling facility, what about the one that is informal? So this also, the toxic elements may leach into soil or water, okay, they may leach into soil or water and tap into household water sources or come to contaminate even food chains. So a study conducted in Ghana actually suggested that contaminated water has the potential to, had the potential to, quick, to, to kill aquatic life, those, um, uh, those living things in, that live in water. E-waste management in developing countries, particularly Africa, was um, found out to be environmentally unfriendly, and this, these findings were disturbing given the dangers of e-waste in the environment and well-being, according to our research. And then the factors of improper management also was because the e-waste regulation is absent and if it's any, it's actually relaxed. Then there's a legislation issue, which is uh, characterized also by the failure of the international regulation, which is the Basel Convention, which was adopted in 1989, uh, for, which runs across the, the borders. Actually, it controls the transborder movements of hazardous waste and their disposal. So this is not binding and allows loopholes for illegal, illegal waste trade. According to Baba Tunde also, he urges urge, urge that illegal trade is motivated by poverty and corruption. So our, we had the three points that we were discussing in our paper. Um, basically, it was the benefits that we get from using mobile phones, specifically SMS, and then also the potential environmental hazards which is uh, hazardous to human beings and the environment, and then also the management of these electro electronic waves. So our conclusions were the following, that there is the trans transformative power of MHO cannot actually be in ignored. Yes, the, the use of these mobile phones and all these services cannot be ignored. It's actually improving the delivery of health services in Africa. There is more evidence-based work needed on how mHealth advances the healthcare though in these uh, developing countries. And then also mHealth has been found instrumental in educating and informing, informing both rural and urban communities um, in health-related matters. SMS service has been identified as significant, the most uh, commonly used, and is reshaping um, how healthcare is seen in African cont in context. The downside is the management of obsolete M health equipment. In the African region, management of EUS is inadequate. Um, though this EUS is, can be hazardous, but it's also variable, uh, which is an open area of research yet it can still be toxic and harmful. This paper suggests awareness about detrimental effects of e-waste on health and ecology. These are the references that we use. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Kini Wheelie. And many thanks for our esteemed uh, speakers. And it's time for questions. Uh, my first question is, uh, for Professor Elisabetta Zoanelli. Uh, I agree that uh, standards and tools uh, are uh, for evaluation of risk of cyber attacks are fundamental, I agree. Um, if I well understand, do you have made uh, a prototype of this system through the POC uh, platforms? My question is the following, uh, how can we ensure that the standards uh, and tools uh, are uh, complete, are effective, uh, and the, the diagnosis will, will be good? Uh, is there any test uh, or uh, findings about uh, that, that, uh, that uh, field? And my second question uh, is for uh, Salim al -Ashanab. Uh, you said in your conclusion that uh, the question is how to solve the problem. Uh, the three uh, issues that you have mentioned in the conclusion uh, are for sure uh, with relationship uh, with financial and uh, uh, network deployment. 
Uh, my question is, uh, if uh, uh, local uh, resources are limited, uh, do you uh, ask for need or help from international organization? And uh, if yes, uh, what is the result uh, uh, of this initiative? Thank you. Excuse me. Is this the last question for Salim or Mahmoud? About Rof Somalian, Rof Somalian Rof universities, Rof yeah. Rof okay. okay, excuse me. <laughs> yes, you put a very interesting question about standards and tools. As you know, at the international level, uh, whatever the Say the range of sale, both at uh, uh, infrastructures and uh, devices, products, has to do with standards. The idea by the first American research work on this kind of development had to do with the fact that if you impose a standard, then you control the market. So the fact that you can have standards for knowledge representation in this domain, which is a very, very tough domain, it's very important. My opinion is, first of all, that whoever works in this context, and that what well, the, the literature I presented to you uh, is in this direction, has to merge. We cannot have uh, different lines of interpretation of phenomena, and this is one of the critics' point. Uh, the second thing is uh, our platform. At present, as I was saying to some friends, uh, say in coffee break, uh, we're trying to do one thing. We propose big uh, companies in Italy working with cyber security for the government uh, and so on to reclassify their corpora of data and see how this reclassification can lead to a decision making through also uh, what is machine learning. And we have the possibility of predicting attacks and interpreting attacks, making prevention, if we reclassify and interpret data in a relational manner. So this is the solution we have envisioned. Yes, thank you. Um, this research is just to finish it. And our plan is first to discuss with Somali higher education, communication and technology. After that, we can ask our help to any other organizations. From the first time, we have to discuss with the higher education ministry. Thank you. OK, uh, other question? Yeah, please. Hadia, please. <laughs> Actually, a question. My voice is, is low, so no problem. Uh, thanks for all the speakers. It was an, a very good and informative session. Uh, it's not a question. It's uh, good news to Elisabetta in regard to uh, ontology. I would like to tell you that Birzeit University, on the 25th of September, has launched its uh, search engine with 150 multilingual lexicons and a linguistic ontology for Arabic. And uh, uh, this lexicon will be working and helping the, uh, in, in the IT applications. And uh, uh, it will help Palestine to uh, move into the fourth circle of the economic revolution. Thank you. If you need to, to reach that, uh, it's on the la uh, university website, birzet.edu, uh, uh, sorry, birzet.edu, uh, or directly go to ontology.birzet.edu to know more about it. This is a very good news, even though uh, I must stress a point. When we talk about control vocabularies in science, we mean with that we must have descriptors uh, at a logical semantic level, which is not only the fact of having glossaries or uh, they are called ontologies. Ontology is something a little bit com more complicated. And so in uh, lexical entities, which are only part of an ontology, you must have a number of multiple relations, but also you must have a propositional, contextualized uh, uh, descriptors 
And this so far is not excellent. We have tried to do that, and the ontologies I presented to you have this uh, flaw, basic flaw. They are, they are based on the analytics of entities, lexical entities, which is not enough. So it's a good, I mean, threat, the one that you said, but this is not enough in order to have an ontology. They finished with semantics and now they Yeah, but semantics, you see, one of the mistakes, three mistakes, first mistake, there are people that believe that, uh, for instance, oh, ontology web language, which is a metadata language, is this. This is a mistake. We are not, we're talking about the second mistake. Uh, the lexical uh, semantics, which dates back to, say, in the 60s in the States, where the, the first studies, um, uh, they're called the semantic memory, were started. And the, uh, the uh, say, the translation into a, a support and electronic support started are just the basis. Nowadays, if you look at ontologies, they, ha they all have more or less the same approach. They give you a, is a definition, then they give you what they call attributes and properties. This is not enough. So what I'm uh, holding is, unless models become really articulated models, you don't go any further. So these are the problems we face. To conclude, I I've shown you a, a number of approaches. Uh, if you look the way they describe uh, relational uh, concepts, you see that they are not tenable at a, a, a theoretical level. So what is lacking is the ontological upper level definition. So, I mean, this, the things you said will help, but it's not enough. No, it's, but you, uh, it, it has more. You have to go and the first application, if you remember, was at Stanford University. They started with a pro project that was called WordNet. Perhaps some of you are familiar with it, where they identified links according to some sets and a number. But this was a long time ago. We have, to, we have gone a little bit further. So the point is, at this moment, we need a sound ontological. Uh, but I will have a look anyway. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Is there any question? Uh, so, I, I, have, I have a question for, uh, for Prof. Elisa and one for Prof. Salim. Uh, my question to Prof. Uh, Elisa is that, uh, what, what are the semantic uh, functionalities of ontology used in your uh, tool? And, and uh, rather than classification, if, if you mention classification, yeah. I'm talking about the how do you know the ontology has many uh, uh, functionalities can be uh, benefited, like reasoning, uh, a lot of a lot of a lot of functionalities. We'd like to know what 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 are the functionalities you benefit from. Secondly, have have you built uh, you, the ontology from scratch, or you used uh, some existing one and make some integration or something like this? M my, my second question to Prof. Selim. Uh, uh, w w what are the most important applications for the magic square? Thank you. Uh, your question is a very interesting and complicated question. I'll try to be quick. Um, an ontology is an attempt at describing uh, conceptual entities, yeah. uh, and they are based on two, uh, two conditions. The first one is a definition of the concept which has to be univocal. That's why everywhere we, we should use control vocabularies. A control vocabulary, it's a list of items where definitions are univocal, are unambiguous. So that's the first thing. The second thing is to define relations that in an ontology work at a different levels. Namely, you have a category, say, of an entity as a category, which is linked at different vertical, horizontal levels which is not in a, um, in a taxonomy. A taxonomy is supposed to be a classification, but the very, just to put an example, the very notion of class uh, should distinguish between what we mean, uh, the distinction between an intentional meaning and an extensional meaning. Namely, you have two different approaches to describing properties and attributes of the entity. Second, uh, we must have, in order to understand the function of an entity, you must have a, what is called a propositional approach. Namely, you have to, to state 
things concerning that entity. So as for functional, uh, you hinted at a very important uh, consequence. If you want to make prediction, namely you have corpora of data, the first question is, whoever sells you uh, big data analytics, a tool, I don't mention tools, what we call just tools, objects, these are fantastic technologies that are no good unless you have an architecture. And the architecture is the ontology. So what they do, for instance, when you do threat intelligence, you go into internet. I say, why do you use a crawler like that first? Let's develop a filter, an architectural filter. Then you get data. Then you can work on data. And then they can reclassify. So the point where you have got today in cybersecurity is that we have enormous amount of data that are not classified, not even at a taxonomical level. So that's a problem we have. Okay. okay. Uh, there's another part for question. Have, have you reported the ontology from scratch? No. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that yeah. was yeah. perfect. That, that is what uh, people who work on this call it a middle out uh, approach. Yeah. Namely, you take sources, top down, bottom up sources. Yeah. You collect these sources, try to adapt. For instance, we have used a very important uh, enumeration repository called the KPEC. The KPEC uh, is an attempt at classification, but it has a fantastic amount of oh. items. We have inserted KPEC taking out the, the taxonomical approach, we didn't work in our control vocabulary. So we use, reuse a number of data sources, otherwise we couldn't work, yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, regarding magic squares, there are sometimes applied statistics and uh, in cryptography, where you can make a very hard breaking uh, coding, yeah? It's not too easy to decode it if you don't know the right code. Mm -hmm. So, but I'm not very expert in that field, but I think it's, uh, cryptography is also a secret uh, science, yeah? yeah. Usually uh, used by military, so they don't tell people how to, uh, they, they do use it, yeah. But I think they, it has some applications there. Okay. okay. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, my speakers again for their very nice uh, presentations. And I have good news for you. This is the last uh, uh, session. Uh, because the last one uh, was cancelled, so you are free. I'd like to, uh, to greet uh, our speaker again. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.